Welcome to the Darkness Dwells podcast, episode 115. I am Jason White. I'm Michael Schutz. How you doing, Michael? It's been a little while. It has been a little while. We'd be on episode 250 if we had been keeping up, I think. Right? Yeah, we <laughs> Is would my be. Is math right on that? I think you're, you, you're right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Happy Father's Day! Well, thank you. Yes, we are recording this on Father's Day. And uh, I've had a pretty good Father's Day. I uh, I got actually a physical copy of H.P. Lovecraft's uh, his collected fiction works. Oh, it's a nice. pretty nice, uh, pretty nice copy. It's not as nice as the I think it was. Um, what's your main bookstore in uh, in the U.S.? Um, like Barnes and Noble. Yeah, it's not as nice as the Barnes and Noble copy, but. Uh, it's still pretty. Uh, it's still very pretty. <laughs> it's very pretty. It's got a really decent cover to it. I like the. Um, I'm collecting the little paperback sets of the Ballantine books. Oh yeah. For um, the 95 cent ones, I have my Lovecraft like within arm's reach from 1965 or 70. Or seventy. Wait, there's so many copyrights on Lovecraft. It looks like seventy three. Yeah, I like I like those, but yeah, that's pretty cool. It'd be nice to have like what you have, and have all of them in one nice one nice one volume. Nice volume. Yeah. That would be that would be nice. Yeah. When I read all of Lovecraft's stories from beginning to end, I uh, I read them off on my Kindle because uh, you can get like the whole. Everything that Lovecraft wrote, ex- excluding his letters, you could read all his stories and his poetry for like ninety nine cents. It's ridiculous. Wow. <laughs> I think you sent me that link. Yeah, or, I, I or think you I sent, sent you the book. The book. I yeah, sent you the book. Me. Yeah, because yeah. Uh, it was uh, DMR free, and uh, like like I said, somebody just collected it and threw it all together into one thing. There's like a few different versions of that now. Is he like is he like Poe? There are some collected works of Poe that they've edited the text, and it's not like actually the complete text. Yeah, uh, it depends where you get the stories from, because like sometimes S. T. Joshi edited uh, the stories, and sometimes it's other people. But yeah, it, it depends like where they're oh. getting their source from. So how are you doing, Michael? I'm doing good. Oh, the summer heat is here. Oh, uh, it's not too. I'm just busy doing rewrites and edits. I'm kind of going out of my mind. Yeah, you're kind of but, busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a lot of projects that I kind of didn't feel like doing, and then they all came due. So now I'm paying for it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that always happens, though. Speaking of which, there's some people out there waiting on my projects. I'm almost done. Okay, if you're listening to this, I'm almost done. I got it for you. <laughs> almost done, okay? <laughs> Very good. Very good. <laughs> so, uh before uh before I phoned you here, um we were uh you you mentioned the uh, Doctor Sleep trailer. Yeah. And I watched it just before hitting uh hitting the call button. What do you think? Well, it's hard for me to say anything. It looks creepy. But I haven't read the source material, so I can't compare it to anything I've read. What do you? Yeah. I know you've read it, right? I have. So what do you think? The two things that I like about it is one, you and McGregor. Yeah. And two, it's directed by Mike Flanagan. So it's yeah. got to be good. It's got to be good. I don't know how uh, close they'll stick to the. I'm going to read it before the movie comes out. 
I well, the thing not. is, the weird thing is Dr. Sleep is the sequel to Stephen King's The Shining. Yeah. The movie Dr. Sleep looks like it's obviously the sequel to Stanley Kubrick's film version of The Shining, which is not only different from the source material, but Stephen King hated that version. <laughs> yeah. So this is weird. So I don't know. You know, I, I can see why they might have went with that. Though, because, I get to. because it's iconic that movie yeah. re- regardless yeah. and i'm sure stephen king's aware of this it's it's an iconic movie within the canon of horror movies that uh, you just can't ignore it if you're gonna adapt the sequel yeah. from the book you, you you're probably gonna want to stick with some of the elements from the movie yeah you're a little bit tied i think yeah you're kind of stuck i wasn't like freaked out by the trailer like you know i get goosebumps Every time the Star Wars trailer comes on, or or uh, pretty soon it previews are going to come out, yeah. I suppose. Which I'm not going to watch because I know anything given away. But I didn't. I didn't feel all juiced. I didn't no. feel juiced when I when I saw Doctor Sleep. Well, the the funny thing with the trailer on that is uh, I noticed that they were uh, they were going for they were trying to build up a lot of. Uh, uh, suspense and so the trailer itself kind of moved slowly it's sort yeah. of like that you know uh, haunted house story where the dude's walking around in all these dark rooms yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. there's so many haunted house movies like that where somebody's they could easily turn on the lights but they don't <laughs> and uh well, you get that scene where they they click the uh the switch a couple times Oh yeah, yeah, and you know, look up when, at the light to see that it's not going on. And when the lights off, you see the shadow down the hallway <laughs> that they don't see because it's behind them. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I don't know. I, I think it's going to be f- uh, fun in a sense because I haven't read the book. I can I can read the book and then go see the movie, and that's always fun to do. I find. Yeah, yeah. You know, I just watched your. Well, I don't know if it was the latest, but I just watched one of your. YouTube channel shows and I know we're in agreement with that I think that we like to read the book after we saw the movie rather than read the book and then go see the movie yeah well I I like doing that I like doing it both ways honestly because you can you see the movie and and it's very surface level but when you dive into the book it's uh, very much more it's deeper, you know, obviously. Yeah. You can get in the, inside the character's head. You can uh, explore so many other areas of the story. You can see a lot of the connections that that the film maybe kind of brushed over. Yeah. Or likely didn't have at all. Or how they changed everything. I mean, either way. I remember when I was younger, though, I, I was very strict. Uh, read the book, watch the movie, hate the movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yep. But now, Lather, now, rinse, repeat. Yeah, now I, I find that, you know, to do a really good uh, adaptation, you have to take an element of the story and expand upon it, usually. And if you try to go, like, beat per beat, then you're going to come up with a mess. And, you know, I have a very fond spot in my heart for Pet Cemetery, the movie, because oh. I, I watched it before reading the book when I was a kid, and that yeah. movie scared the shit out of me. But I watched it right after reading the book, and it, it was like a holy mess because you could see that they were trying to to follow every important beat that was in the book. And it, when you see that, it, it do you know what I mean? Like, I do. I think about I, like the best um, screenwriters and directors that that do the best adaptations. I think about Rob Reiner when he did Misery. He cut out all that stuff about addiction. Because it wasn't going to play on the screen and he didn't need it. I think about Ted Talley, who who did uh, Silence of the Lambs. He pretty much, he used material from both both Thomas Harris books, both Red Dragon and Silence of the Lambs. And he knew exactly what to cut and what to streamline. So when you're making the movie, yeah, if you try to put everything in, it's going to be a mess of a movie. There's yeah. an art of taking out and finding the distillation that makes the best movie. Very true. All right. So this episode, uh, you know, you, you mentioned addiction. <laughs> so you know what? This is sort of like an addiction um, themed episode because yes. uh, because we're, uh, we're well, first of all, I, I sat down with uh, Rob Ford and 
Matt Hayward, they recently wrote um, A Penny for Your Thoughts, and, and we have a, a pretty good discussion about that. And then Michael and I, we're going to discuss uh, a, <laughs> a pretty crazy movie from 1988 called Brain Damage, and both are heavily influenced by addictions. And uh, so that was a good segue, you know, an unconscious one, but... We put together a pretty slick show. You we, know that? Yeah, we do. When we, we do. we got to edit that out so people don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's a secret. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, when we return, we're going to be discussing the 1980... Or actually, no, first we're going to talk with... Uh, we're going to talk with Bob or Rob Ford and Matt Hayward about their book, and then after that, we're going to... Uh, we're going to return with a discussion on brain damage. Welcome back. This week, as promised, we have two amazing guests with uh, Matt Hayward and Rob Ford. How about you guys uh, introduce yourselves? Yep, sure thing. Uh, my name is Matt Hayward, and I'm a Bram Stoker Award nominated author from Ireland. And uh, I'm Robert Ford. Everybody calls me Bob. And uh, I am a horror writer based in central Pennsylvania. Excellent. Thanks, guys, for coming on. Oh, you're welcome, man. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So to start things, I usually have like a little bit of an icebreaker. And uh, recently on, I think it was Twitter, I saw, Matt, that you recently wrote a comic called This Is How It Ends. And there was a music video made for it where you make a couple of appearances. It's pretty cool. Can you tell us a, a, just a little bit about that? Yeah, that was done for the band uh, Walking Papers. Um, Jeff, the the vocalist, is a good friend of mine. And uh, I was in Seattle with him. Um, he was shooting some music video, so we didn't have too much time together. And I was working on a comic book with an artist called Seb Mester at the time. And uh, before he left for lunch, I just showed him a couple of pages. And as we were driving, he goes, um, you know, would you be interested in doing an adaption of a song? And I said, all right, I'm listening. And um, what ended up happening was the art style of the pages that I showed him, we ended up using for This Is How It Ends. So it's pretty much a straightforward 30-page adaption of the song from the album. And then an animator came along and made the music video out of it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and, it, uh, it is pretty cool. I like. I like. I watched it, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's a cool band. It's got um, uh, Jeff and Ben, and then it's got a uh, Barrett Martin played drums, who's a the drummer for Screaming Trees and Mad Season, and then uh, Duff Duff McKagan from Guns N' Roses as well. That's really cool. Yeah, it was awesome. I was a big fan of Mad Season and uh, Alice in Chains and all that. Yeah, <laughs> we actually um, we got uh, permission to use. Uh, some Screaming Trees <laughs> lyrics in A Penny for Your Thoughts, actually. Oh, that's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Now, uh, both of you guys have been doing, like, really great work promoting the novel you guys uh, collaborated on, Penny for Your Thoughts. And I noticed, Rob, uh, you, I saw a reading that you did for it online. And on Matt's Ooh. website, he says that you're the best, uh, one of the best <laughs> in the business for, for doing uh, live readings. So I was wondering, what do you do, Rob, to uh, to prepare yourself for a reading? Well, I mean, early early on, you know, attending, you know, conventions and things like that, you know, you get to see a wide variation of, of live readings. And I just, uh, you know, I started seeing some readers who they only sat at the desk and, and they didn't really engage the audience as much as other readers. And then there are, you know, other live readers, you know, Tom Montalione and Joe Lansdale. And, and these guys really kind of, they work the room. They turned mm -hmm. into much more of a performance than, than just a reading. So I started watching these guys and going, you know, that's, that's how this stuff is done. That's how, you know, you need to, you need to be doing this. So I, I, don't, I don't really stand at the table too much. You know, I work the room. I walk around. I make eye contact with the audience members. Um Working up to a live reading, I definitely practice a lot and get to the point where I have quite a portion of it memorized before I actually get to the reading itself. And uh, it just really helps the flow, I think, to engage the audience that way and really kind of make an impact. And on occasion, you uh, scream at people as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, I've been I've been known to do that from time to time. It's uh, you know you got to keep them at, the, at their full attention, so to speak. You know, it's just live readings are just for me. It's one of the the most fun things to do. You have that audience's attention for you know twenty minutes, a half an hour, and and you know I always felt you might as well make the the best of it while you're there. Yeah, that sounds really awesome. I I really hope to see that live one day. I hope so. All right, uh, Matt, you're not new to collaborations. Uh, recently, you you released Practitioners with Patrick Lacey. Um, what drives you to collaborate with other authors? Uh, well, in the case of Pat, it was uh, we just wanted to work together for a long time. We're very similar. Uh, we started out around the same time. Pat is about a year ahead of me, and um, we just started popping up in um, anthologies and stuff next to each other. And uh, he's one of the first authors I became friends with when I started writing. So um, it, it just grew very organically like that. But when it came to um, A Penny for Your Thoughts, I had a an idea that in my head felt very like something Bob Ford would write. And uh, initially I was going to write it by myself. But then the more I thought about it, I just thought, why not just get Bob Ford in on this <laughs> So Rob, did he did he approach you and say, "Hey, I got this uh, this story <laughs> idea that you might be interested in collaborating with"? Yeah, yeah, we uh, we were talking. Uh, when I met Matt. We, we met each other several years ago at, at a uh, convention down in Williamsburg called the Scares the Care Convention, and uh, and we had known each other and got to you know we became very fast friends and kept in touch. And this uh, this last year. Yeah, we were outside just kind of, you know, relaxing after the day. And, uh, and Matt came up and, and said, you know, I have this have this idea. And he, he started talking about it and, and uh, asked me if I'd be interested in working with him. And I said, well, yeah, hell yeah. You know, and the more I thought about it, I think we, we both stayed up to like two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning that night. And I kept running this idea through my head. I kept thinking about it the, the whole next day. And. Yeah, by the end of the weekend, we were both full, you know, fully on board with with working with this, and uh, I just knew that it had it had legs behind the concept. It, it was definitely going to be a novel. There was no doubt in my mind. So yeah, no, it worked out really well. I'm very happy. You know, it was it was it was a blast working on this thing with Matt. Before we go any farther, just for people who haven't read it yet, and might be interested, can uh, Matt? Can you tell us what Penny for Your Thoughts is about? Yeah, so the basic idea is about a guy called Joe Openshaw who um, just got out of prison and he's trying to get his life back together. Um, he has a very rocky relationship with his dad and he's uh, back home living with him. And um, he's an ex-junkie, so he um, he goes for walks a lot to kind of clear his head and um, he stumbles across a penny jar. And the wishes, this penny jar is full of wishes and, and they're all written by a little girl from the 1950s. And uh, so he starts reading through them, and um, each one has a, a little link and wee penny from the 1950s tape to it. And uh, the more he reads them, the more he realizes that uh, this girl's life gets progressively worse. And um, those wishes start coming true for him. And uh, he decides to have a, a control group with his two friends and gives them wishes to read. And uh, all this the bad stuff... Uh, sorry, the stuff that the little girl wished for starts coming true for them, but not in ways that they expect. So, for example, um, she wishes for a bite of luck at one stage, and uh, how that manifests itself is a very unique thing. <laughs> you know, one thing that surprised me about this book was how intelligently comedic it was. There was just some like uh, things that happened... <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, you know, a lot of horror books tend to, uh, how do you say, uh, body shame people. And you guys could have went that route so easily with uh, one character, Kenny, <laughs> but you didn't. And I, I truly appreciated that myself. Um, how did what, how did you guys approach the humor in this? Was that a conscious decision to not, like, start uh, calling somebody disgustingly fat all the time as in you, f you find in other horror books do you know what i mean <laughs> you want to take this one matt <laughs> <laughs> yeah there was no real you know conscious effort it's just whatever we found kind of funny we did <laughs> because you know it wasn't yeah. um yeah we didn't really talk about it or make um, a strict decision to 
to do it one way or the other. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it no, was. It, Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I just we you know we as as the characters were developing, it uh, we just did the best that we could to really remain true to their character and what they would do and and how they would react in that given situation. Mm. So the humor that we approach, I mean, there's 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 always been this sort of interesting relationship between humor and horror. And I think when they're used delicately, I think that they can elevate the other, in, you know, if used in, in, in the right way in the same piece of work. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, their reaction when they suddenly get scared, some people's reaction is to just bust out laughing in that moment. Very yeah, it's a, it's a laugh of lunacy and, and panic, but it's still there. And yeah, Matt and I, as, as he mentioned, you know, we didn't really talk about it ahead of time. It just sort of develops as part of the, the, the character's personality. Mm. Um, so, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's been a fun, interesting thing. You know, the, the majority of people's reactions has been really, you know, really pleasant. And, and they definitely understand the joke behind it. Yeah. So it, it was a fun thing to work on. I think, I think Kenny's timeline or his character uh, arc was one of my favorites i couldn't help but think <laughs> oh poor kenny all the time you know <laughs> he's a fun character uh, the other the other thing about that when it comes to um or it did like did we make a conscious decision or anything like that um the thing that i like about bob's writing and i do it myself is to try to um stay true to how the characters would speak and how they would act, mm. even if you don't agree with it. I think that's important. It creates conflict. Mm -hmm. um, for example, uh, there was a reviewer who didn't like how pop, or no, it was, yeah, how they called some of um, the, the language misogynistic. But, um, mm. you know, jo Joe himself grew up with a single dad in a, a, a trailer park. Uh, he grew up around junkies, and that's the kind of language that would be in his head, you know? Yeah. So, trying to stay true to that i think is very important you know you can have asshole characters without the author being an asshole <laughs> right very true yeah. Yeah. It, it, they have to be believable you know as a character and to have them speak in a different vocabulary in a different vernacular that just wouldn't ring true you mm. know yeah and you know what this did uh ring true and it made me wonder about the character creation when you're collaborating how when you actually first let me backtrack a bit how did you guys split up the writing duties um it, it was pretty seamless um we didn't again you know we didn't really talk about it or plot it um i had come up with what what i thought was going to be the first chapter and sent it to bob and uh, i think it was just a day two days later he had sent me back you know an, another chunk and we decided to make that the first chapter so it was very just whatever the the story called for for example if if i saw that bob was on a roll I would say, you know, do you want to take it for another chapter and I'll wait because you can see he knows where he's going with it. And um, so, it, yeah, it was just out of necessity. Um, mm -hmm. We let we let the, the writing dictate itself, you know. Yeah. So so you guys basically uh, uh, pantsed it. Yeah, oh, completely. <laughs> Absolutely. We, we, it, it was uh, the, in concept. It was an entirely different thing. And then, uh, you know, once we started and it sort of it, it started breathing on its own. We just thought, yeah, let's let's just let it go and see where it, <laughs> where it wants to go. Yeah. yeah, we didn't. We really didn't work with an outline. I mean, Matt and I, we kept in touch. I, I'd say almost almost daily. I would say, uh, but we didn't really work with an outline and and that freedom to explore. You know, as the plot developed and as characters development, that that was just a really you know beautiful thing. It was a beautiful part of the process. I believe was. Uh... Was doing it this way um, easier because you weren't the only one responsible? Uh, there, there was some funny moments where a, a character disappeared, and um, <laughs> he, you know he hadn't come back in a couple of chapters. So I, I, te I text Bob and I said, "Do you know where he's gone?" And Bob goes, "No, I thought you knew." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, actually. Um, Jason, you probably know the the part where, yeah, it's not going to ruin anything if I say it, but you know, Kenny goes away for a little while at the end of the novel. Yeah, that that was unscripted. We we oh. didn't know where he was. <laughs> 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 well, you know what? It worked out. Like it worked. It worked out great. Yeah. yeah. Maybe maybe the story just needed that, and you guys 
on an unconscious level knew it, but uh, it wasn't like a conscious thought until it was time for him to come back. <laughs> it, it might that might be true. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I'll, one other thing. Actually, I'm going to go to the character comment now because it kind of ties in with this. Um, how when you're both writing a character because I found that I couldn't really uh, I couldn't split up your voices. And that's mm-hmm. something that's kind of rare, I think, honestly, in uh, collaborations. Uh, how did you guys keep consistent with, a, you know, a character's characteristics? Because cause sometimes you can, in some collaborations, you can, like, whoa, wait, what's going on here? This character wouldn't do that, you know what I mean? But mm-hmm. this, the characters always stayed within character. How did you guys uh, fit that in? Well, I think it started out naturally like that be- uh, because the the initial concept was me trying to. Well, it wasn't trying. To, it, was, it was a Bob Forty kind of story that came to me. So in tone, I was already in that. That's in Bob's kind of style, and I know his work very well, and I know how he'd approach characters. So as a as a fan of Bob's work, I think that lent to blending the voices much much easier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and, and both, I think both Matt and I, you know, in, in our past work, we're really focused on just making sure the characters are believable. So, you know, character development is always a, a strong point for both of us. So as, as we were alternating, you know, sec- sections of the novel back and forth, you know, e- even from a style standpoint, uh, we didn't, we didn't really, uh, it, it's come up again and again in reviews that, you know, our writing is pretty seamless you know, that, that no one can really tell who picked up and, and, and who carried the, you know, the next section. And that's that's a high compliment uh, for both of us, I believe. But we didn't really we didn't really try to, to work very hard on that. It just really flowed right from the beginning. Mm. Uh, it was just a very easy process, I believe, for, for both of us to, to, to work together on this. Yeah, the, there's a couple of things like if Bob had a character say, uh, say the word seen in, instead of saw. I would pick up pick up on little things like that and try keep them very you know consistent when when I was writing dialogue for them mm-hmm. in, in how they even phrase things and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. lost track of, I had a question about that but it's like just poof, gone so I'm just going to move on <laughs> with the uh, with the interview I was wondering you know uh, we were talking about pantsing and outlining uh, do you guys as individual writers do you do you normally pants or do you outline I'll let Bob Bob go first. Yeah, you know, er, early on, even when it came to short stories, yeah, I was, man, I, I was an outline fiend. Um, I, I, early on, when when I, I was just kind of getting rolling, I just, I didn't want to make mistakes. I, I, I kind of wanted to get a feel for where things were going right from the start. And as I continued to write and gained more confidence and, and started getting published more often, I started letting that slide a little bit. Um, I, I do enjoy the freedom of kind of allowing things to develop on their own. And I, I've, I've always felt if it's going to be a surprise to me as I'm writing it, then it should be a, a pretty decent surprise to the reader as well. Uh, you know, there's a project I'm working on right now that is much more complex than the type of plot that I normally write. So I wrote pages and pages of notes on that. And that's kind of serving as my outline on its own, but I, I really don't break down chapter to chapter anymore. Um, I, I just like the freedom and, and not being inhibited uh, to uh, to lock down, you know, where things are going to go from the start. Yeah, yeah, I, I was very similar. Um, when I first started out, I would try to outline, but then um, very quickly, uh, when I was reading, you know, uh, uh, writing advice, I came across. Joe Lansdale and um, I was a big fan of his work but I'd never heard him talk about writing so uh, I started reading as much of his stuff on writing as possible mm. and uh, I quickly just threw it away um, and it was one of the best things I ever did um, pretty much every novel I've ever written has been unscripted I'll have an idea that um, I, I know the opening I know maybe three key scenes I know mm-hmm. that they'll, you know, scene one will fall somewhere in the first act. Scene three is uh, definitely in the third act. But then getting to those scenes and padding that out is uh, the fun part because it will always take twists and turns that you never see mm-hmm. coming. And that it keeps it interesting for you. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, one of the things that Lansdale said is it's like um, plotting is like uh, blowing your load before fucking. It's a... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> 
keep it exciting. Uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Lansdale. <laughs> I know some some writers who are very passionate about, and that's one reason why I ask, because while I noticed that I've talked to writers who have collaborated before, and they always, almost always say that they uh, outline because they're working together, when maybe normally they don't. So, uh, but you know, when you throw out the question on Facebook or Twitter, and man, do you get some backlash? <laughs> There's some very <laughs> passionate people about about that. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know it's it's a matter of whatever works for you, whatever whatever gets the story written quicker. You know, there are no um, just more than one way to skin a cat, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, most de- every everybody's got their process, you know, oh, yeah. And, and yeah, like Matt said, whatever works for you, you know, it's some people are night owls; they stay up to two in the morning writing. Other people, you know, get up at four in the morning. You know, I know Kevin Lucia is. He's a guy that gets up really early in the morning and, and cranks out some words, you know, before going to to his day job. It is it, whatever works for you. Outline, don't, you know, what, whatever, whatever, yeah. however, however it feels right. I think as long as the job gets done, you know, for sure. Mm-hmm. Now, I remember what I wanted to say earlier. Uh, it was more of a comment, actually. And it, uh, one of you mentioned uh, that there was a review that said it was the book was kind of misogynistic um mm. but i didn't i didn't find that at all honestly I, I felt the 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 women in in the story were strong very strong in fact you don't want to fuck with these women yeah <laughs> well i th- i think um i think they mean the language and i suppose you know again it's because the, the character grew up in a trailer park um around meth heads it's it's his vernacular like how we saw it and um again a you know, some of the female characters speak not too fondly of other females. And uh, Pop, for example, would have been of an older generation. And um, he, he's a very insulated guy. He doesn't hang out with people much. He reads the newspaper by himself. He, does, he doesn't have the internet, etc. So when he refers to um, women and stuff, his, his voice might be a little more harsh than a, a modern person because he's not, he's not of that generation. So it's, it's how he would speak, you know. Exactly. Exactly. No, I couldn't agree more. You know, it's and, uh, you know, again, it's it's just trying to, to remain true to the character development. You know, it's uh, if we were if we were writing about a, uh, you know, a guy in a motorcycle gang, he would have a certain way of speaking. Uh, you know, if we were writing about a, you know, a guy who was uh, you know part of a white supremacy group, he would have a certain way of speaking. I think no matter what it is, you, you run the risk today of offending someone. Yeah, <laughs> um, and the best that you can do as a writer is just to remain true to the character and the and the story, and kind of let the chips fall where they may at the end. Yeah, you know? I think it's it's kind of funny that we have to say that it's 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 not an endorsement of that speech. You know, it's <laughs> it's not saying that it's it's right. It's it's just how that person would speak. Yeah. Right, 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 right. I think some readers forget that that we're you know trying to make things. You know, writers try to make their worlds seem realistic in order to suspend your disbelief you have to make it realistic in some way and so uh you know that kind of language is going to be like you guys said uh the reality of this world exactly yeah. well i think you know bob and i will our main focus is character <laughs> development per, uh, personal mm-hmm. stories that's what that's what we like to do and um being I'm I'm not American, so the the whole political landscape over there it just doesn't interest me, and I've no um, I've zero interest in writing political commentary. It's not what we're here to do. We're here to write about characters and you know their arcs and their developments, and hopefully people can relate to that. Um, how it's said might be a little harsh, but uh, <laughs> that's that's just how <laughs> it has to be done. You know? Yeah. Well, that's that's uh, you know, as the saying goes, that's showbiz, baby. You know, it's, it's <laughs> I mean, you know, and that's the thing about art, whether it's, you know, uh, music or, or the written word or, you know, paintings or whatever. Everybody kind of, you know, views it or reads it or listens to it and they take away something different. And, uh, you know, it, it, it should be thought provoking. You know, it, it should provoke you to think about it longer, uh, you know, than just the, 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 the immediate moment. So, you know, overall, I think the, the reviews that have come in have been so extremely positive. You know, most people, you know, get the humor behind it. And so Matt and I, overall, we couldn't be more pleased with the kind of reception that, we, that we've had on the novel's release. Oh, it's been, it's been absolutely fantastic. Really. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I've been reading some of the reviews, and uh, yeah, it's uh, you guys have uh, have been raking it in, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it it's deserved though. It's it's a really fun book. I really enjoyed reading it. And one thing that I really enjoyed was the uh, the rules of of the world you guys created. The, the yeah that. The yeah, that was jar. hard. Yeah, that was very hard to keep track of actually, because we hadn't established that before we started. So, kind of, um, you know, having to go back and change earlier wishes and how they came about and the the consequences, because we were kind of right writing the rule book uh, in real time. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that that was kind of difficult. <laughs> Did was there a lot of uh, rewrites needed because of the complexity of uh, the magic system? You could call it. Mm. Not, not really. There was, there was just a couple of scenes where somebody had said something that was no longer um, canon to how we had established things. So we'd have to go back and just change individual sentences, and mm -hmm. so it was. It wasn't too bad. No. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Now, uh, one more thing about the book that I really enjoyed was the cover art. <laughs> how much input uh, did you guys have in that? Oh, <laughs> oh, we. Um, well, B Bob, I think, had come up with the, the concept of having the, the penny jar in the rain, in the mud. And um, so we told Ben about that. And Ben is a phenomenal artist. He did a lot of cri uh, Crystal Lakes stuff. He did um, Welcome to the Show for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, he also did um, King and Chismar's um, Gwendy's Button Box. Mm -hmm. So we kind of, yeah, we, we kind of wanted that feel, that kind of uh, in Gwendy's Button Box, it has an almost... Uh, I can't even describe a homely kind of feel, if that yeah. makes sense. And uh, yeah. I, I don't know what the right word for it is, but uh, we, there's a specific kind of feel we wanted for it. So we gave them j just that idea of a penny jar on its side. But when it came back, it was it was so perfect. <laughs> yeah. uh, we Matt and I were just he he sent me the email and or sent me the text message about it, and uh, he said, "Are you ready for this? I think you need to sit down." And uh, and he shot me over the image, and we were just blown away. I mean, we were. You know, we were like kids on Christmas morning. It, he, oh, yeah. just, he knocked it out of the park on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he's he's such an amazing artist. I mean, that's like something I would hang on my wall, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, mm. it, no, he's he's absolutely incredible. Now, do you guys uh, think that you'll collaborate to, again together? <laughs> Yeah, here's the funny thing. <laughs> <laughs> we we've made such a nice little world for ourselves, and um, there's a certain feeling, you know, there's a, there's a magic to it when every time you put the pen to paper, writing in that that little briarwood and lowback and all those sort of areas, that um, I we we can't stay out of it. You <laughs> know, we have yeah. to go back. We have to absolutely, <laughs> and. Um, the minute we finish this, actually, we, we already have another thing pretty much plotted to the same extent that we had Penny before we started that. So, mm -hmm. Very mm -hmm. cool. So, yeah, um, yeah, we de definitely will. Uh, I'm, go I'm going to stay with Bob in, in August, so I imagine by the time we leave for scares, we'll probably have the first draft done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I imagine over several pints, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be brainstorming, but yeah. They're... Yeah. The definitive awesome. answer is, is is yes. Matt and I will definitely be working together again. Very cool. I can't wait for that. Um, now, I was wondering, you know, since the theme of this uh, episode seems to be collaboration, I was wondering, as individual writers, uh, do you guys have, like, a bucket list writer that you would like to collaborate, collaborate with most that's not Stephen King? <laughs> yep. Um for myself, I would love to write something with Keen, uh, Brian Keen, because uh, mm. I think uh, we tend to go the same direction once the story gets rolling, and I think that would be very interesting to do. Plus, I just I love his whole mythos, the, the labyrinth mythos and stuff like that. Um, I'll have to have a give me a minute, and I'll, I'll think. Oh, Edward Lee, I would oh, love yeah. to write whatever. <laughs> uh, not not for the reason most people think. When a lot of a lot of people read Lee, you know, they assume to the sex scenes and stuff like that but lee is extremely philosophic and i th i think it would be very interesting for him to bring that to the forefront and tone down his heart i just i would just be very interested in seeing what would happen if lee sort of switched up his formula a little bit but uh but then again it wouldn't be an edward lee novel but uh i, I would like to be involved in something like that i matt hayward that would that would be a lot of fun i would like to read that one I, yeah, I very <laughs> me <intrigued> too. <laughs> to see that one, 
for sure. Yeah. He um, wow. yeah he wrote the forward to uh, what the monsters fear for the mm-hmm. thunderstorm edition. So, I mean, I, I, no, I don't want to ask him, but, but that I would, yeah, that would be a dream project. <laughs> Very cool. For for me, I think I, I would love to work. Uh, I, I know it would be a very surreal uh, Salvador Dali esque trip uh, to work with John Skip. Oh um, yeah, yeah. I love to to work on something with with Skip. His his uh, his novel uh, Conscience was phenomenal, and I was I was lucky enough to see Skip read it live, a portion of it live, and it was a packed room and uh, standing room only at the back, and and I noticed when Skip started reading, he lowered his voice intentionally. Uh, the story is a first person account, and. He lowered his voice and I looked around and I saw everyone leaning forward in their seats. And it was both his reading and the story itself. And it just blew me out of the water at the time. Um, so I'd like to work with Skip and and also Lansdale. I don't oh. care if it's a Western or a crime. I don't care what it is. I, I would be just overjoyed to work with Joe on something. Oh, a, a Bob Ford Joe Lansdale collaboration would be like my dream read. I, would, I <laughs> fucking love that. Yeah, I love Lansdale, man. Actually, I oh, have a right. I have a Lansdale story. The one time I met him was at the uh, World Horror Convention, uh, two thousand and seven, I believe it was in Toronto, mm. and uh, I was uh, heading to the bathroom. I mean, we were doing a night of heavy drinking in the uh, in the rooms. And uh, I was heading to the bathroom when suddenly a hand touched me on the shoulder. I turned around. It's fucking Joe Lansdale, and he's like, uh, "Can I can I go in there? I need to get get a case of beer from the from the bathroom before you uh, because we had all the beer in the <laughs> in the bathtub, right?" And I was like, "Yep, you know what? You're Joe Lansdale. You can like just take the bathroom if you want." <laughs> he's, so, he's terrifying in person. <laughs> Well, not, he, not in a bad yeah. way. He's just, no, no. Uh, his presence is just so overpowering, you know. And maybe, maybe it's just I built it in my head because I just love his work so much. Or, you know, he, um, Keen introduced me to him, and uh, the, within five minutes he told me how to mask my scent in the woods yeah. if I was ever to like. Oh yeah. Just... No, yeah. there's, there's, he's, he comes in. You know, stories are embedded with him wherever he goes, and. Yeah. No, I don't. You're not. You're not wrong there, Matt. He he is uh, intimidating in person, and I think, you know, I mean, because he's been doing martial arts, invented his own style, you know, for years. There was a, there was a uh, he, he and and Keen and uh, Jeff Cooper and the late Jeff Gonzalez were all together, at uh, at some bar years ago, and started discussing, you know, techniques. And in 0.3 seconds, he had twisted JF Gonzalez into a human pretzel. And, you know, <laughs> Gonzalez was just looking with this plea of help on his face. And, you know, Joe is a very intimidating, but he's, he's such a sweet guy in person, too. You know, yeah. that's the thing. You know, yeah, very totally willing is. to help out new writers and, and give advice. You know, he's very warm and welcoming, too. Yeah, like, he's incredible. Yeah. When he stopped me from going to the bathroom there, he was like very polite and about it and he was smiling. There was I didn't feel like I was gonna get a karate trapped at the throat or anything. You know, it was, yeah, it was no. just like do you mind if I get a, a you know, a case of beer from the from the from the bathtub before you go in there? And I'm like, Yeah, no problem. Do what you want, <laughs> man, my friend. <laughs> when you can when you can kick everyone's ass in the room, it comes with manners and politeness, I think. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, one last question before we go. Um, what advice would you have for writers who are thinking that they would like to collaborate with someone but have no idea how to go about it? Hmm. Um, for me, uh, just just go do it. Seriously, mm-hmm. <laughs> I I don't really think that I have anything specific to say. It's just um, yeah, don't be afraid of doing it. Um, oftentimes, if you if you find somebody who is different to you you can end up uh, elevating each other's voice in ways that you wouldn't have been able to do alone i think that was the interesting part of a penny for your thoughts is i'm not usually a humor guy but getting to work with bob that sense of humor thrown into my style definitely elevated what i would normally write and gave it a um it made the darkness darker and the 
the funnier side's all the more funnier because Bob's a way better writer than me. So, <laughs> oh, shit, <laughs> I don't know about that. But no, I, you know, I, yeah, if you're if you're thinking about collaborating, you know, I'm with Matt on this. Just you know, definitely just take the take the plunge and do it. You know, I mean, I I, I spoke recently a little bit about that, and I think I think it's really important. You, you have to trust the person that you're going to be working with. I mean, obviously, you're going to pick someone who is, you know, along the same skill and talent level as you because you want to you want to bounce off each other and make it work. But you have to pick the right, you know, the the right sort of uh, flow style. You know, I mean, there are there are tons of writers that I respect and, and adore and love their work. But I don't think that maybe I could write with them because their style is is so different than mine. Um, so alignment and trust, I believe are the, are the, are the best things. I mean, you know, like I say, I, I knew Matt for, for years and, and, uh, knew his talent level and, and just his personality overall. So I could trust him easily walking into this, this, you know, this project and say, well, I, I know he's, he's going to do fine with it. And I trust what he's going to do with the plot and the character development and things like that. And, and, uh, no, like I say, it was just an absolute blast. So that would be my advice for any writer considering it. Just just get on wagon and do it. Just, you know, consider those things ahead of time. Excellent. So before we go, where can uh, readers and listeners find you guys online? Yep. Um, my, we- <clears throat> my website is sundancegrow.com. I'm on Twitter at Matt Hayward IRE, and the same for um, Instagram. And if you just search Matt Hayward on Facebook, I'll, you can find me. <laughs> Yeah, my website is robertfordauthor.com, and on Twitter, I'm uh, Bob Ford, uh, same on Instagram. Very cool. Well, thank you guys for coming on. Um, you guys are both welcome back anytime. Thanks so much, Jason. It was really yeah, fun. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. All right, thank you. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Pain has a face. Allow me to show it to you. Gentlemen, I am pain. I see dead people. Hi, I'm Chucky. Wanna play? When there is no more room in hell, the dead Okay, so, (laughs) you know, I I wanted to do 80s film schlock kind of series because, honestly, it's really, uh, it's kind of selfish of me because I I love this crap. (laughs) Nobody makes movies like this anymore. For good reason. (laughs) What did you make me watch, I don't know, man. It's pretty crazy. Jesus Christ. (laughs) So, Brain Damage is from 1988. <laughs> it's written and directed by Frank Hennenlauter. Uh, you might recognize him from the Basket Case movies. And... That's why, okay, I, I was going to look that up. Yep. That's later in this discussion. Yep, and uh, Frankenhooker. Uh, okay. I think, I don't know if he's done much beyond those, but uh, but yeah, he, <laughs> he did that. Okay, uh, he it, this movie is starring uh, Rick Hurst as Brian. Gordon McDonald as Mike, who's Brian's creepy brother, and Jennifer Lowry as Barbara, and Barbara is Brian's girlfriend. There's a bunch of other people, but you haven't really seen any of them. The synopsis for this one is, one morning, a young man wakes to find that a small, disgusting creature has attached itself to the base of his brainstem. The creature gives him a euphoric state of happiness, but demands human victims in return. (laughs) All right, so this movie starts off pretty crazy. Um, you know, you have that old couple, and they have a plate full of brains. And they go to the bathroom with the plate full of brains, and once they look into the bathtub, they start screaming and panicking, and you're like, what? Screaming and screaming. I had to turn turn the volume down so <laughs> my did neighbors too. didn't call the police on me. Which happened before, right? <laughs> Jeez. Which has happened? Yes. Yes. That has happened. <laughs> so I thought I was keeping somebody in my apartment. Yeah, you know, I had to do that too because 
the screaming, like, I have to watch, when I watch these movies, I watch them at night, and everyone in the house is sleeping. And for some reason, those screams from that old woman are so That's loud, like, geez, so much louder than the rest of the film. Gosh, she wails. Yeah, like, ah, ah, and it just goes on and on. <laughs> Very long screaming scene. And I like, you know, I like this, the director sort of built up the, uh, uh, the suspense on this, I think, because you're like, what's in the bathtub? What's going on here? And then they show that the bathtub is just full of water and it's empty. And you're like, okay. <laughs> what? They're freaking out over an empty bathtub. Yeah, it was a really nice WTF moment. I did find. <laughs> like- this movie is full of them, though. Um, and then they go on like a mad search through their apartment, like totally destroying everything. So obviously they're looking for something. I guess they were holding in the uh, <laughs> in the bathtub, and the brains I, I'm supposing were for this uh, whatever it is. <laughs> and then they go through the uh, rest of the apartment building, except for where the creature actually ended up, and that was of course with Brian, and uh, and he wakes up feeling sick, and uh, he looks sick. He's feverish. He's sweating, and he's also got like a hole in his neck. <laughs> But uh, his girlfriend come, shows up, and, you know, this I, I mentioned Brian's creepy brother because uh, when she shows up, uh, he's the one who answers answers the door, Mike, and and he's looking at her like she's a slab of meat he's about to devour. <laughs> like, he's creepy. <laughs> his lips are wet, and uh, he's just like, hey. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're like, oh, God, this is... Movie. This guy is freaking me out. <laughs> like, I, this guy, I don't know. Oh, Gordon McDonald, he never did anything else, and I can kind of see why. <laughs> because, oh. oh, I mean, like, come on, man. He's like, he's like, oh my, he's creepy. Didn't you find he was creepy? He was, he was, but, but uh, everything going on with Brian was far creepier. I tell you. This movie <laughs> yeah. has more homosexual undertones than Friday the the Nightmare on Elm Street two, the <laughs> famous the famous gay nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, you know you're right because the like I'm thinking of the shower scene. The that, shower that's, scene. That's the biggest part. The uh, when when he's got his face planted against the alley wall. Um, with his blood in the underwear. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> everybody running around in their tidy whiteies. <laughs> yeah. Man, this is this is a confused young man. This is somebody that, that is hiding secret desires. He might be. He might be. <laughs> Although, you know, that was never a theme. It was just, I think, a, I think it was honestly just a, a sort of circumstance of, of the the making of the film itself. Maybe it was more of a reflection well, of the director. Well, he's got a penis in a bucket, for Christ's sake. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know what? Uh, maybe I don't think of it that way because I'm uh, I'm straight. I saw more of a, like, an, a, sort of an addiction uh, story because of all the, uh, the drug, the, him being high and... Uh, Very much. Yeah. And, you know, bad things happen when he's high and yet he keeps getting high and, like, the blood in the underwear thing. <laughs> so so anyways we we find out that this creature thing is it's like a giant slug that's about the size of uh well it's like the size the of a... the 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 um chest buster yeah from, uh, exactly Caleb. yeah Very much like but that. this thing exactly. talks like and he has little eyes <laughs> yeah he has little eyes and and a little mouth that becomes pretty big when it's time to inject the uh the juice as it is into it's Brian's juice. neck and and I I love the way this creature talks because yeah. he, he sounds like a, a he sounds like a, a gentleman cover- from Britain or something. Yeah, <laughs> he's like hello, a little Brian. He <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Brian, Brian. Yeah, <laughs> you will feed me brains, Brian. <laughs> yeah. And he laughs when he's laughing during like some pretty kind of upsetting moments. Uh, he's like going to town laughing. He's like, oh, ha, 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 ha. he's really he enjoying himself. Around. Oh, he just gets into it. Oh, my Sorry. God. You know, one thing Sorry. I didn't look up was uh, I didn't look up the voice actor for that. I, I looked it up a long I didn't time ago. See it, 
I didn't see it in the credits. I just found the guys that made him. Oh, really? Yeah. I don't... The fan flipped my... Okay. Gabe... Gabe Bartolos and David Kindlon. Kindlon. Gabe Bartolos and David Kindlon made Elmer. <laughs> I couldn't find his voice anywhere. No, neither can I. It's got to be here because I remember seeing it. It's got to be ago somebody. That we, you know, it's like Burl Ives or something. Yeah. Oh, well, <laughs> whoever it was, they did a brilliant job. Uh, you know, it's something I'm usually against, honestly. I've read some books where the uh, the monster has spoken almost like a English gentleman, but they're supposed to be like a, you know, this disgusting ghoul type thing, right? Yeah. And uh, and that always turned me off, but I guess maybe it's the tone of this movie that makes it work, I think, um, you know, for what it is. I mean, this movie, by far, is, is not a masterpiece. <laughs> it's total schlock, and it's total fun. And, and like you say, because of the, the whole voice and, and the talking talking slug works yeah (laughs) when it shouldn't it really should don't watch this movie with your parents though no because there's that blowjob scene the blowjob scene holy crap (laughs) yeah because he's at the bar and uh trying to prove his masculinity yeah and he's bouncing around like an idiot and this uh, (laughs) i don't know if she's a prostitute or if she's just interested in him but this woman comes over and she starts dancing with them, and then they go into the back alley or the bathroom or whatever the hell that was. Because why was there a lineup for that anyway? Um, so they go in there and they're making out, and it looks like he's going to pass out. And so she goes down on him <laughs> to uh, try to keep him awake, and she gets a, a different surprise, <laughs> something else jammed right into her mouth. And they make it so it looks like, uh, you know, it lo- it looks like she's giving him a blowjob. I mean. Wait, this- that was like NC-17 shit. Yeah. You know, that movie Killer Joe got an NC-17 for the chicken scene, for the chicken fellatio scene. <laughs> Anyone who has not seen that movie is like, what? <laughs> but yeah, it was the chicken scene that got that. And this movie has that? Man. Yeah, and uh, you know, Elmer, who's the creature, that's his name. He, uh, he's he got like the blue veins. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, pulls out and just a slap and... <laughs> yeah it's just such a fucked up scene oh my god um uh the acting uh the acting is overdone especially on brian's part i think um because he he's almost like that old woman at the beginning of the film he <laughs> he, he makes a lot of noise and it's unnecessary his his happiness is is, is it's kind of scary yeah, it's it's kind of scary because it's like he gets For too excited. For what it is, I was impressed with the acting. I mean, it's not as awful as some of these movies are. Yeah, I really thought you're right. Um, I thought that uh, uh, Brian, uh, who played him again, Rick Hurst. I thought that he was a little bit overdone. So he was like a child, you know. I guess maybe if you're. Ex- they were really going for the whole euphoric sense because when he gets high, yeah. that's when he starts jumping around and laughing like a like a two year old, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but you know the rest of the cast, aside from maybe the creepy brother, uh, the acting was pretty good. The creepy brother reminded me of the guy in Nightmare on Elm Street who goes to jail. That guy. Oh, Johnny Depp. No, not Johnny Depp. His uh, his friend. Oh, okay. Oh, and he gets killed in jail, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> I'm, surpri- I'm surprised that I don't know. You don't you don't like him at all, but I thought I thought Mike was played played well enough. I'm surprised he didn't do anything else. Yeah. Well, I mean nothing of any great import, but I'm surprised he didn't do a few more of these. Well, he creeped me out, man. Just the way he was looking at um at at Brian's girlfriend, like well, yeah. like licking he, his lips, he and he's her like right away. Yeah, oh yeah, and he, he wants. He wants to gobble her up, and he oh, eventually yeah. does. <laughs> he succeeds. Um, you know, there is a fascinating moment in this film that I thought it kind of veered away, and this involves that shower scene. Because um, Brian comes to a point where, in the beginning, he doesn't know that people are dying with this uh, creature that's making him so high. He's so fucked up, he just doesn't... Yeah, yeah he doesn't remember any of it. But he, it gets to a point where he he does know, and he tries to break away from it, and uh, 
And this is where the whole addiction thing comes in. He gets really sick, really bad. Yeah. And it's almost, it's like a junkie, uh, a heroin addict uh, coming down, basically, uh, or, or withdrawing from the drug. And he's like, you know, vomiting everywhere. And it's just a very dark moment of the film. And then he decides he's, uh, you know, he's had it. Uh, he decides he's going to, uh, you know, he has to make a choice. Either he goes with the creature or he uh, or he breaks away from it, and he makes the wrong decision. I, I found that interesting. And that's where he ends up in the shower with that big muscular dude. And, uh, and you know, he it's wants to unleash... nice, by the way. Yeah, I like, that holy was really cow. Nice. <laughs> well, hey, I guess, man, I guess if you have... Happen? I <laughs> guess if you have all those muscles, you know, you, you're not too worried about this little creepy guy coming in and staring at you like he is. Well, Maybe he's I, even flattered. If I was Brian, I would have been, you know, vice versa worried. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a drop the soap moment. Uh, yeah. But uh, but I just like that moment because for me, you could see him fighting. Like, he doesn't want to do it. He doesn't want to unleash that creature and kill this dude. But he has to because he's in agony. And I thought that was done really well. I really wish I wanted him to hold out. I guess I guess I got really involved in this movie because I really wanted him to hold out and and break Elmer because I bet Elmer was starving for brains. He was putting on a on a good front and singing and everything. Yeah. I just I just wanted Brian to wait until Elmer started begging like, "Man, I'm hungry. Don't don't you want my juice, man? Come on, I'll give you my juice. I'm hungry. I need brains." But yeah. But no, that it didn't go that way. Fucking smart ass making fun of our guy. Yeah. But he, he does make the uh the right decision eventually, but it's you know, it's too late for him to be redeemed. And some interesting things happen. Um I don't know, do you think we should spoil the end? Yeah, nobody's gonna watch this. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so well it's been out for like the journey years, so. is so good that even if we tell you how it ends, I mean, you should watch this. Yeah. So, so if you if you like to to smoke the pot, which I don't, but if you happen to, I bet this would be a good movie. Oh, it's definitely a, a weed yeah. movie. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. This is a stoner movie <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so if you're into that, definitely partake. Yeah. We don't necessarily condone that kind of behavior, but we're just saying. If, if saying, you're into it, if you do already, yeah, you, you might as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the ending, uh, the old couple, they return. Well, Which I thought uh, they were dead. Yeah, because I was surprised because of the foaming at the mouth. I thought they yeah. were. Yeah, but dead. no, they were just uh, coming, nope. withdrawing from the drug. So they're like, you know, getting really sick. And when you see them again, boy, do they look sick. They they look oh, like goodness. they've uh, they've lost something serious yeah, like, and like it's affected half. them physically and uh and they return in an alley now you know what i can't remember exactly what's happening in the alley i know he's is he trying to feed in the alley but they interrupt and uh it ends up feeding on them and uh during the struggle though brian gets one hell of a wicked dose of this uh drug <laughs> Because the old man, like, clenches on it while it's on his back, and he squeezes, and it just squeezes out all the juice into his head, into his brain, and, uh, uh, he ends up going home, and, uh, and he, the juice is, like, coming out of his eyes, his ears, his mouth, everything, and he takes a gun that he got from the struggle, and he, he blows his own head off, and all that comes out is light, this purplish ugly light and it like that to me right there is really really interesting honestly because it, it spoke of like you know the type of shit i'm into with weird fiction <laughs> it has a surprisingly grown up um metaphorical ending yeah you know and with the with just kind of showing the the light through the windows and very dark ending, and everything was like, you know, the direct the writer director took it at a very interesting place. I, you know, yeah, it didn't end schlocky, really. I didn't. No, it it kind of had a serious end, even though uh, it was 
uh, well, the whole movie is strange, but uh, the ending was uh, very strange, weird, sort of, what the fuck? And it makes you think, like, what what the hell? <laughs> is, his, uh, is his head now, like, uh, an abyss towards whatever realm this creature came from? Yeah, like a gateway or yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they don't explain it. They just end it there. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, brain damage pretty much from beginning to end. Yeah. Uh, it's a very strange movie, but if you're into having... You know, this is another film, I think. We've had these films before. Where it would be fun to watch with your friends and just and just trash it while you're, you were watching. And, you know, have a good time. I, I think you have to watch it by yourself and don't let anybody know. <laughs> It's just me. So I'm 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 guessing that you gave it like five stars. <laughs> Shit, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I gave it four because uh, yes, it's a pretty silly movie. It's uh, it doesn't take itself seriously though, even though it, it gets to serious moments, like the uh, Brian battling himself in the shower scene there. And also at the end when he uh, when he shoots himself in the head and and the light comes out, there's a there's an interestingness there, and the rest of the movie is just pure fun. I uh, this is what I talk about when I say I like schlocky '80s films. So well, I'm on stars board, stars. man. Four stars for me. Oh. I'm with you. All right. I'll do it. You know what? The, most people will hate this film, though. It's it's. Uh, well, you just can't expect quality i don't want to say quality it's a schlocky movie yeah it's, it's very for what it is it's not like four stars like head on a hot tin roof but yeah it it's uh yeah it's four stars for what it is if you wanted yeah. to take it seriously then it would probably be like a one or two stars well maybe two stars but yeah. i'm i'm taking it for what it is it's uh, yeah exactly and, and it's a four star for that yeah for that and you know what i think a lot of serious reviewers don't take that into account when they're watching they films don't like this. They don't. Yeah. At, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that's brain damage. Uh, we definitely recommend maybe, uh, you know, some reefer. It's legal here in Canada, so I And can... here in California. Oh, yeah, it is too, right. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, I don't feel too bad about saying, hey, smoke a joint and watch brain damage. <laughs> well, my God, when I step outside of my apartment, it smells like... A marijuana farm. Oh, so yes. everybody around here does. I was in I was in Toronto a couple of weeks ago, and uh, everywhere it smelled like weed. I mean, this is going to become a thing <laughs> where people are going to come to Canada just so they can get high. But the only the difference is uh, you have to get it through the government and you have to do it through mail. So it's not like you can just really? yeah uh, you it's can't mail order pretty much at least in Ontario. Um, it's mail That's order. And I don't know if it's like that anywhere else, but but you know, pretty soon you're going to see where it's going to be you're going to be able to buy it from stores it's just not available like that right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a process. You know, it's still it's still a schedule 1 drug here. I didn't know that. Yeah, it it's, is. It's deemed as harmful as as heroin. It's you know, like That's ridiculous. You know, we're talking about the stupid opioid crisis. Not gonna get into all that, but but like OxyContin is is just a schedule, like a, they're like two or three, yeah, you know, benzodiazepines are a schedule four for crying out loud. There's, that's weird. Marijuana. It is very weird, but there's uh, a there's a there's like a a cold war going on with so many different things. Yeah, that's a sociological that's part sort of, of thing. Yeah, there's uh, there's all history there. Yeah. Interesting times, <laughs> and it's funny how this movie kind of fit into that discussion. <laughs> it was very much, you know, it, I really liked when they showed the juice um, in the brain. Yeah, the blue. Snapping all the synopses, yeah. you know, and, and sparking there. It was very much a, I really don't, it, it, uh, it rode the line between a just say no movie and a just say yes movie. <laughs> it did, yeah. They certainly showed the downside and everything. Oh, they I certainly guess, did. I guess they, it's a, a, a say no, but yeah, they show the upside, the fun, 
Yeah. And then they show the downside where you're, like, dependent on it. And that's really interesting because it's such a silly film, and yet it goes there. It goes to those yeah. areas. Oh, and, and I forgot to mention the, the basket case thing. There's that scene when he's on the subway and the guy yes. from Basket Case sits down. So yes, the basket I put that case. In my notes. I didn't know that he did both movies. Actually, I was going to get into that because uh, I have, um, as I've been doing lately, uh, the f- the fun trivia. And uh, on the subway, Brian sees a man carrying a big basket with a lock on it. The character is Dwayne Bradley with Belial inside the basket from Frank Henenlotter's previous film, Basket Case. And that, you know, that was brilliant. I loved it, but it, it dragged on too long. Because <laughs> the he... guy sits down and he's just staring at them. And, it you know, it's so obvious. If you've seen these movies, it's so completely obvious that they're shouting out his previous film. It's cool, but it lasts way too long, I thought. I guess it could have been just to sit down, look, and They should on. have just had him sit down, and that was it. They shouldn't have... I don't think they yeah. should have went as far as they did, but yeah. it's still he, fun. He made sure that people saw it. <laughs> yeah, he made sure you saw yeah. it. Yeah. You're gonna... You, you could have looked down to your popcorn, rooted around for a nice buttery piece, looked <laughs> up, and it was still on the screen. Yeah, exactly. Oh my gosh, I want popcorn now. And you know what? I didn't like uh, that scene anyway, because that's... Uh, he he's got the creature hiding in his mouth and he opens his mouth and it like pops out and you can just see that it's so fake it's it's awful. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh there's another couple here. This is an interesting one. You may have noticed that Brian he had a an unexplained cut on his lip throughout the yes, film. Yes, yes. Yeah. Now that was actually uh apparently it was a part of a subplot involving him getting to a into a fight the night before defending his brother in a bar fight but due to time restraints uh they they couldn't film it but having said that frank hennenlotter the director claims that he had uh hang on here he claimed that he had makeup effects give rick hurst a split lip throughout the movie because he thought he looked too fucking pretty and that it (laughs) wasn't from a deleted fight scene so who knows where the truth lies in that but uh, it's it'd be interesting either way, honestly. <laughs> it's I like you're too pretty. We got to bruise you up a bit. Yeah. Huh. And uh, those scenes that we described, those were taken out for the uh, actual theatrical yeah. releases okay. and and the original home video releases. I guess they were put back okay. in. This is like the the version that we saw is sort of like the director's cut. Sweet. Okay, but, that yeah. makes sense. Because I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> wondered about that. That was that, too much. That was that was yeah. You're getting That's, into X rating there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I saw that, I'm like, whoa! I did not just see that out of <laughs> 1980s movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Holy crap! She is totally blowjobbing his gross his, work. His little a- yeah. Elmer creature. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> And uh, as Brian oh, wakes... Oh, I heard your kitty. Yeah. That's, oh, that's hi, little, baby. That's little hi. Minerva. It's Uncle Michael. <laughs> and last one. Uh, Brian wakes up for the first time in his bed at the beginning of the movie. His head is covered in blood, and there's an album poster spotted on the wall, and it's Slayer's Rain and Blood. Oh. Which is pretty interesting. I oh, guess they this... were going for some Kubrick stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think that does it for this film. I think we've rambled on too long about it. You know, I I admit I tried to talk you out of this one. I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't. It turned out to be much better than I thought. Yeah. And there was a lot to talk about. Yeah. And you know what? There's a, there's another one I want to do. Uh, and I know you're probably going to hate it. But if, I bet I won't. I if, bet I won't. If ever, if anyone's looking for this, we both watched it with our uh, Shutter subscription, so definitely check it out on that. Shutter doesn't represent us in any way, but uh, it's on there, and most of these movies actually are. So uh, you can watch them with your Shutter subscription if you have it. And uh, you know, I recommend it just for the fun. Shutter's good. There's some others out there that have real selection problems. Yeah, I, I like yeah. Shudder. Shudder's the best, honestly. Yeah, they really are. All right, we're going to take a quick break, and when we turn, we're going to close out the show. Oh. <laughs> All right, 
right. So that was that was a lot of fun that episode. Oh, gosh. I'm glad I watched that. Yeah, I'm it was, it. It was you, crazy. I had film. to watch. I had to watch it right before the show because I put it on last night and my attention wandered. But uh, but that was because I had things to do on my on my phone. Yeah, I had, like crops to harvest on my game on my zombie <laughs> castaways game. I had to complete some quests. That's funny. I've seen this movie like three times, and the first time I've seen it uh, was just a few months ago. And I'll probably stop watching it now. <laughs> I kept watching it over and over for the show, and uh, yeah, I'm done with show. it now. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I believe and that. I want to thank uh, Matt Hayward and Rob Ford for coming on the show and discussing their book with me. And I want yes, to thank, that was great. My yeah. apologies for not making it. Uh, that that interview was scheduled at an insanely early time for me. But uh, I want to thank them for coming on the show, and I want to thank you, dear listener, for listening. And if you want to get a hold of us, it's easy to do. You can reach us online. We have a website, which is uh, wheredarknessdwells.com. You can email us at, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, darknessdwellspodcast at mail.com. And uh, we we have a we have a page on Facebook that you can like and a group that you can participate in, um, though it hasn't had much traffic recently. And uh, also we we're both we have a Twitter account and the uh, the handle for that is at darkdweller74. I think that's all of it. Yeah, that's enough at least. Yeah, for sure. That'll get you started. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so uh, so stay tuned. We have uh, more episodes planned. Even it may take us a while. It probably won't. Uh, I'm not going to make any promises though. <laughs> nope. nope. So, so thank stay you, Michael. Off the juice. Yes. But stay dark, my friends. Stay dark indeed. <laughs>